So in the first part of our lecture, we saw that just communicating with, uh, you know, our UART is going to take up about 10% of our CPU time. Is there any way we can reduce this? Can we offload the CPU? And the answer, of course, is yes. We have, you know, our CPU over here. We have our memory. We have our GPIOs. And, uh, you know, our UART is going to be connected, let's say, to the GPIOs. And we are going to really be using up a lot of the CPU's time in order to communicate it with it. So what can we do? We can add some dedicated hardware over here that all it does is it deals with the UART. And that can offload the CPU and let the CPU deal with other things while this controller is taking care of the communication. Let's see how this works. So how do we offload the CPU with the controller using UART as an example? UART we saw is a slow serial protocol. One bit is transferred at a time at a really low baud rate that goes from 1,200 to 115,000 bits per second, which is very, very, very low. What we could do is integrate a specific controller that offloads the CPU. If we can go and deal with a whole byte at a time instead of dealing with you know one bit at a time, we already get a 16x speed up because we don't have to double sample um, by the CPU um, each and every bit that comes in. Okay, it's actually more than a 16x speed up, of course. So um, what we can do is we can communicate with the UART through a wider register, like a 32-bit register, and actually send you know the uh, 32 bits at a time or receive 32 bits at a time from the UART. What we're going to do probably is we're going to use some sort of shift register that will serialize and deserialize the data. So if on this side we have the, the transmit and on this side we have the receive um, unit of the UART, what we would have is some sort of shift register over here that's going to take a wider register, an, an 8-bit register in this case, and it's going to serially you know, push out each and every one of these 8 bits plus the start and the stop bit. On the receive side, it's going to get you know, the start, the stop bit, and the 8 bits from the transmitter, and it's going to store them in a, tri a shift register. And then the, uh, parallelly, it's going to be able to read that out, while parallelly, that's going to be able to read this in. If we add you know, some sort of a five or something like that, we can buffer up several CPU transactions, and then we can use, you know, uh, again, a bus of 32 bits, store them in, you know, some sort of a FIFO or something like that, and then um, the, the CPU can really forget about it. So if we have a 64-byte FIFO, we already get a 512x speed up over what we had to do in um, uh, dealing with the, with, the, uh, with, with the UART all the time by by the CPU. If we only, you know, read once in a while at 32-bit uh, granularity or something like that, that will really help us. So in general, this is the um, idea of hardware acceleration. We called it a controller because those are kind of simple accelerators, but nowadays we usually talk about these domain-specific accelerators um, and uh, really how we go and offload the CPU and do things that are really meant to do them instead of using a general purpose type of a computer. So CPUs, they're general purpose programming machines. They're Turing complete. They can do everything. They do everything, but they don't do everything great. Sometimes they're even terrible at, during, at doing certain operations. Instead, we can integrate some sort of special hardware that offloads the CPU and does it instead. So if this is our time you know, going by and the processor is uh, running everything, um, when it sees a certain type of a, a uh, of, of an operation, such as uh, going in and dealing with UART, it can transfer the controller over the control over to the accelerator. The accelerator can go take care of what uh, this operation is, and when it's done, it can transfer the result back. And in the meantime, the processor is free to do other types of stuff. So, is this worth it? Well, it depends. Um, so it, you have to look at Amdahl's law and see that the speed up is the original time it takes to do something divided by the um, the accelerated time plus what wasn't accelerated out of the operation and the cost of the extra communication for transferring um, the, the state and the data and so forth over to the accelerator. Um, but often, really, it's really worth offloading the processor, providing things to the accelerator. And that's really the hardware and software kind of uh, uh, code design where you decide what should be done in hardware with a specific accelerator, which is obviously going to cost us because we have to design it, we have to debug it, it takes up area on the silicon and so forth, but it's going to give us some sort of speed up Maybe it's even going to give us a benefit in terms of power efficiency and so forth. And it's going to free up our processor to do other things. So when we can dedicate hardware to do a specific task, we call it an accelerator. Um, so the CPU, of course, can continue running the program when the accelerator runs its task. And how do we transfer data to accelerators? Well, again, we use memory mapping. So we're not off chip um, right now uh, talking to those registers like in the GPIO or something. But we give specific um, uh, area inside the memory map to this accelerator. And we define what each and every one of these registers is going to do, inside, what each one of these memory um, 
memory uh, addresses is going to do in the accelerator. And there can be a register there or it can be something else. Uh, the accelerator will decide what to do when it gets a read or a write to each one of these. It may have a, a whole bank of memory inside too and so forth. And it also um, write its output status to one of these addresses so the CPU can read and see what the uh, state is. Well, when we use such an accelerator, how do we know when it's done? How do we know for that the CPU? Uh, how does the CPU know that a new byte of data is received from the UART? And the simple answer to that is to do what we call polling. So polling is basically ask the UART every once in a while if it got something new. So it's something like this. Um, you know, we do something, we're in the car, and uh, we're playing games, all the kids are playing games, Bart and Lisa over there. Um, every once in a while, Bart asks, are we there yet? Um, and uh, Homer answers, mm, well, not yet. So we go again, we play a little bit, Bart asks, are we there yet? Answer is not yet. So the whole time, what um, Homer's doing is saying, not yet, not yet, and Bart keeps on asking. So that's really polling. We check on the status of the UART every so often to see if the data has been received or if it is ready to receive new data. Um, polling can be carried out with something like a busy wait loop. So how do we busy wait uh, uh, on input from the UART? You know, we have our infinite loop, which is going, uh, you know, as our external type of a loop, and we wait until a new character has been read. So we're going to peek at uh, some sort of status register of the UART. As long as it's zero, we just keep on uh, busy waiting inside this loop. And once the status register goes up, then we can peek at the data. This, of course, is without the UART controller we're now discussing when we're looking at one, uh, yeah, at one character at a time. Okay, um, and uh, when we want to go and write to it, so again, we have uh, uh, our string that we want to write. We, we have the character that we want to write inside, uh, um, inside some sort of temporary variable. And then we're going to go over the temporary variable until we get to the end of the string. And um, uh, we wait until the UART's ready. So we look at our UART output status. As long as it's zero, we busy wait on this line and when when we stop when the status goes to one when the UART is ready we poke that current character to the UART and uh, we go to the next character and continue like that so that's how we can do a kind of a busy wait loop on the UART so we have our CPU we have our bus our memory our GPIO and now our UART controller but what we were doing all the time is asking are we there yet are we there yet are we there yet and was this any good or can we do any better and of course we can do any better. We can say, excuse me? So what is that? That is what we call an interrupt. So that little minion over there was interrupting our uh, operation over here. And an interrupt is really an asynchronous signal from a peripheral to the processor. So uh, an interrupt can be generated from peripherals, external or internal to the processor. And it can also be uh, done by software itself. And it frees up the CPU while the peripheral is doing its job. So we have the CPU over here. We have our data and address bus that goes and um, talks to the uh, CPU. It has its status register, its data register, whatever it's doing. That's what we've uh, been working uh, with you know, our controller or our, or our um, accelerator. Um, but we also have these two new types of, uh, of uh, signals. One is an interrupt request and one is an interrupt acknowledge. So when um, uh, an interrupt request is made, um, what happens is the CPU decides when to handle the interrupt. So depending on how important the interrupt is, it may stop everything it's doing right now, or it may finish an operation, or it may have a timer that says, you know, only handle that interrupt once in a while to, to, um, to meet whatever type of spec it needs to be. Um, then when the CPU is ready, it acknowledges the interrupt. So it says, you know, listen, I'm going to be now, you know, handling your interrupt, clear the interrupt. You don't need to keep your hand raised. I'm going to deal with whatever you asked for. And then um, we call what we call an interrupt service routine. So an ISR is just a function, but it's a special function to handle uh, that certain type of interrupt that came along with this special signal that came from this specific device or accelerator. Okay, and when we finished, of course, it's just a function. So the ISR returns and the CPU continues operation. So that's basically how an interrupt works. Of course, there's a lot more to talk about interrupts, but that really helps us to um, deal with things asynchronously, to deal with it when the processor wants it and not have to busy wait all the time um, through polling. 